bless each one of you today. This is Pastor Gabriel McCurtis coming to you live from Oxnard, Unity Christian Fellowship, Church of God in Christ. We're here today because this is the Lord's Day and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We had a wonderful worship service on this morning and uh, uh, we sang the old Kojic song, Yes, Lord, today. And we just thank God for that. We're going to be coming from Matthews 6, 25. And we're going to go from 25 to 33. And I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, I, I could say seek ye first the kingdom of God. I can call it that. But I'm going to be dealing with worry and concern. And what God is telling us how to deal with these things. So I'll give you the title in just a minute. But it says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life, is not life more than food, the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? I'm going to go on, but I, let's call this today, Why Worry? You can also say, Stop Worrying, but Why Worry? This is what Jesus is laying out before us. He's saying, Don't you know that God cares? Why are we worried? He goes along and says, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not more, uh, much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. So, I'm, I'm, I'm reading, but in, in the text here, he's saying worry indicates a lack of faith. Repeat that after me. Worry, worry. Indicates, indicates a lack of faith in God. A lack of faith, a lack of faith in God's power. A lack of faith in God's sovereignty. It says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first. This is the solution to worry. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things, Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. What God is saying here, take one day at a time. Yesterday is past. Tomorrow is not promised. The only thing that we know we have is now. Does that make sense? Remember, I didn't just say the only thing we know that we have is the rest of the day. I don't know that. Oh, I moved outside of the, uh, the camera here. Uh, I don't normally move, but I, I got the spirit moved me. So let me get back in the camera range. So he says, why do you worry? Why do you fret? Well, let's go back and look a little bit about this thing called worry. Jesus contrasts heavenly values with earthly values. When he ex uh, explained that our first loyalty should be to those things that do not fade. That's why it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, the things that cannot be stolen or used up are never wear out. We should not be fascinated with our possessions, lest they possess us. Do you possess it or does it possess you? That's the thing that we need to uh, be concerned about. What is my life centered on? Is it centered on worldly things that pass away? Let, let, let me share. It says, God alone 
deserves to be our master. Either we store our treasures with God to focus our eyes on Him and to serve Him alone, or else we do not serve Him at all. Where does your ultimate allegiance lie? Let me share something with you. Our national church um, uh, building is in Memphis, Tennessee. And while I was out one year for one of our meetings, I don't know if it was the April call meeting, or it could have been the convocation. Whatever it was, uh, I had some free time on my hand, and I said, I want to go down to the Albus Presley Museum. And I drove up to the museum, and so they have things on the outside on the street. There was Grace, what is it called? I think it's called the Grace, Graceland. Graceland. That's what it is. So they have this old, there's a Cadillac, there's an airplane, there's a limousine. But I looked at the Cadillac, and the Cadillac wasn't a new Cadillac because Elvis Presley had his fame during the 60s, 70s, 80s. I think he lived up into the 90s, 60s, 70s. All right, he died then after that. So he had like a 1950-something Cadillac. And the airplane was not like these modern jets we see today. It was, uh, I think, Brother Eric, is, they call them prop planes, the one that have two propellers on each side. Perhaps a turboprop. A turboprop. And then I went into Graceland and started walking through. It was a shock to my system. Because, now, I was born in 1957, but Elvis Presley, by the time I was 1957, I think, yeah, he was born in 53, 52. All right, my, I'm getting some help here. 32? 42. <laughs> Never mind. 37. All right, I'm getting some help out here. When I went into his house, everything was old. Now, it was new during the time that he lived. I saw his color television set, and we used to call it the boob tube. It was an old square-looking thing where you had to change the, change the channels. And then I walked in and saw some of these fine clothes that he wore. It looked like Count Dracula's outfit. And I'm looking, and I'm saying to myself, good Lord, I saw the carpet. Now, Back when we were coming up, people used to have that uh, different color carpets on their floor. Uh, and our, some of our carpets now are much more flat. This was all shag carpet. And when I went in his house, I began to realize this stuff was is old now. And many of those beautiful ladies that Elvis Presley would hang out with and when we were doing the Elvis Presley movies, either they're old or they're dead. And so I began to look. I said, but this is what Elvis Presley gave his life for. Think about that for a minute. How many things on earth last? There's one thing that you would take from earth to glory with you, and that's charity. That's love. That's one thing. You'll never lose your love for God. But there's some things you will not take to heaven. My brother was telling me today, my dad's longtime deacon at the church died this week. I don't even know if you knew about that, but uh, he, he died on this week. And Michael said he was with him right before he died. He said some of the children rode up. And, you know, daddy done worked hard to make a living, to get a house. And then these folks that probably don't come to visit, everybody's going to come and try to snatch something now that daddy's dead. Does that make sense? So the point is, you can't take it with you. The last funeral I went to was my mother's aunt. Her name was Claritha Chester Scott. And she had her diamond, diamond ring on. And she had a nice earrings and, 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 and necklace. And I had never really gone to a funeral where I saw this. But after the funeral, right before they closed the lid, the funeral director came and took the ring off her finger, took the earrings off her ears, and took the necklace off and gave it to her child, her children. And I looked at that, and I said, this is very important. You can't take it with you. 
While I was preparing, as you know, uh, I've been promoted to the office of bishop in the Church of God in Christ. Last week, I got the mail came in, and my my bishop's garments came in, and I already had my uh, I had my chain and my cross, but it's not the one that I'm getting for the outfit. But I put everything on. But when I was looking at the responsibilities of a bishop and what an adjutant, Brother Eric, will have to do when I die, they will bury me in my outfit. They will put my chain and I'll have my ring when I get it. But before they let down the coffin, they will take the gold chain off and take the ring off. I'll still have the outfit. They'll give that to my wife. I can't take it with me. So this is what the Bible is saying. Where are your priorities? Are they here on earth exclusively? Or are they above? Notice this. Notice this. Um, I'm reading from, I had to go on the internet to find this. That It was, his name is, uh, or her name is Barb Raverling. Barb Raverling. So she talked about healthy concern versus unhealthy worry. Now, she says characteristics of concern and characteristics of worry. So I'm going to give you one, which is concern, and the other worry. Concern focuses on others. I have a daughter. I have a granddaughter. I have members out. I'm concerned for them. Now, worry is self-centered. It's all about me. Does that make sense? Number two, See, how many people say, oh, if you die, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You don't know what you're going to do. I'm the one that's suffering. What, what does this have to do with you? Do you know some of the stuff that I've gone through in my life? I uh, had, had back surgery, and my back kills me all, all the time. And, and folks, oh, pastor, I'm worried, worried about me for what? You don't suffer at night. You don't get up at night. It's the, <laughs> you ain't, why are you worried? That's all about you. Well, Pastor, if you go, if you go, I don't know what I'm going to do. You're going to live the next day. Look at this. Characteristics of concern motivates us to serve. Worry pushes up barriers that keep us from serving. Worry immobilizes you. Have you ever got so scared that you don't want to get out of bed? Oh I, oh, I had a dream last night. Uh, uh, I was in a car wreck. Therefore, I'm not, I'm not going in a car the rest of my life. If I had a dream that I'm in a car wreck, I would say, God, what are you saying to me? Because a car wreck does not always mean that you're having a physical car wreck. He might be saying something in your life is out of order that you need to deal with. Lord, what are you saying? God, you know what I need to do. Now, you have to know if it's God... It's going to stick with you. And you might be saying, well, God, I think you're telling me I just need to pray and go through the day. And then all of a sudden, you look up. I went to work this morning, and the place, I didn't go to work this morning. I found out the place was held up. And God protected you. Now, notice this. Concern promotes constructive action. When you're concerned, it motivates you to serve, and it moves you to action. But worry often paralyzes us. Oh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, why do you not know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? A lot of you guys don't know the answer. When I don't know what to do, I say, even in those momentary things when I need to make a decision, I have to say, Lord, help me. Lord, I don't know. Nehemiah was before the king, and, and according to the law, if a man's countenance came before the king and his countenance was down, he could be killed. The king asked Nehemiah, he says, why are you sad? Why is your countenance that, uh, down? And here's what Nehemiah told him. He says, hey, my, the people in Jerusalem are suffering. What is there to be happy about? But he prayed. He, he whispered a prayer to the Lord and, and, and got a word from God. Does that make sense? A timely word. Notice this. Concern is driven by love. Worry is driven by fear. What is fear? Fear is a complete doubt in God's ability, and you're fearing things 
that you think are going to come upon you. You remember Job in the book of Job. He, he feared the thing that came upon him. A lot of folks said because of this fear it came upon him. No, it wasn't because of this fear. Because it was the devil talking to God. And the devil told God, I can't touch him because you have a hedge around him. God said, I'll remove the hedge. You can do everything but don't kill him. It had nothing to do with the man fearing. But fear destroys you. Notice this. Uh, concern is, is a, a, a goal is to help. When you're concerned, you want to help. But fear doesn't have a goal. You just run around with you, like a chicken with your head cut off. Notice this. Concern strengthens relationship. Fear tends to weaken relationships. Last one. Fear, concern is tempered with faith. Fear, you're overwhelmed with doubt. God is saying, when you are fearing, when you are worrying, your eyes are not on him. It's on your circumstance. It's on your situation. Does that make sense? How many of you ever, and if we're all human beings, you can all raise your hand, how many of us have ever feared something that never came true? We feared it. How many times you took a test, you said, oh man, I know I flunked that test. Oh man, I did too. And then the teacher writes you a note and says, you're a borderline genius. And you're saying, what? Oh, you got a straight. Man, some of my teachers write comments on my papers. I know I'm not dumb. I'm far from dumb. But they write comments and I'm saying to myself, I don't, I don't even think about myself like that. Good comments. Dr. McCurtis, you know, you are well versed in this. I said, many times, I'm just one step ahead of the dogs. Does that make sense? <laughs> so how many times do you sit there thinking? Or let's say this. How many times have you thought something in your past would be discovered? See, we don't tell everybody everything. We don't do that. We don't tell everybody everything. We tell everybody the good things about us. I remember when Michael, my brother, and I were younger. And... We were, we lived in the projects, and we walked and saw this old 1940 Ford. And it was old, looked like it was rusted. We thought it was abandoned. So we then got some rocks and started throwing. Busted out the headlights, busted out the windows, just hit the car, all on the side. We walked away thinking that it was a piece of junk. The next day we got up, and saw an old man driving that car down the street. I said, and my heart sank. I don't share that story very much. I was ashamed of myself. I remember in middle school, my friend and I, David Williams, we done, uh, we, we had an after school thing. We done broke into the kitchen and, uh, uh, and just acted silly. Uh, probably took some things that we shouldn't have taken. And uh, went back to school the next day. I got a note from the, I forgot what department it was, but the note basically asked me to come up to the office. And all of a sudden, my heart sank. I said, oh, Lord, I'm busted. And so I walked up there, and I got ready to open up a mouth. I said, please, please, please. It was just a moment of confusion. And they said, Gabriel, we're having a, uh, 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 the uh, arts and craft department and stuff, they're sewing clothes and we want you to model the clothes. Man, I was so, like my sister said, I was so embusticated because I thought I was busted. Does that make sense? My, I never sh shared this with my family. See, this thing, we want everybody to think, brother, I've been saved all day, no evil have I done. I have not been saved all day and I have done some evil. So, when we're dealing with God, and we're, when we're dealing with God, we're looking to Him for guidance. Even if we've done some wrong, and if we're exposed, we're looking to God to cover us. Does that make sense? But when you operate in fear, there is no God. You're rationalizing everything. My, my, my granddaughter comes many times. She plays the clarinet for, for her high school. Very good player. 
I said, Paris, you sound so great. Oh, Grandpa, I hit a bad note. I'm saying to myself, Paris, you, you, what are you? She's a freshman. I think she made up, set, was the second seat the highest? Second seat as a freshman, beating out seniors and stuff. And I'm saying to myself, but when we're so down on ourselves, how can God get the glory? Because of the ill effects of worry, Jesus tells us, do not worry about those things that God promised to supply. Worry may, one, damage your health. There are people that are dying from cancer because they worried themselves to death. You know what else will kill you? Anger, unforgiveness. I got folks, they know things that happened before they were in their mother's womb. I didn't like the way that nurse was talking to my mother. And when I came out my mother, that doctor slapped me on my behind. I'll never forget. And you're saying to yourself, he slapped you on your butt. He was trying to make you breathe, stupid. But we're, see, worry and unforgiveness, these things are not good. But we hold on to them. They're, they're a badge of honor for us. I didn't forgive her. She stepped on my toe in second grade. Hey, how old is she now? 82. When was second grade? 75 years ago. I don't understand that. Number two, worry disrupts your productivity. You can't move forward looking in the rear view mirror. You can't do it. Get in a car and start, keep looking in the mirror, rear view mirror. You're going to run into something. And that's what I'm trying to say. When you're worried, when you're fretting. Now, I am not saying the thing that you're facing does not seem real. Does that? Fear means false evidence appearing real. It looks like they got you. Have you ever, ever was shooting down the freeway, cruising, doing 95 miles an hour, and all of a sudden you see a red light? Now, I, I'm, I'm pushing it for 95, but if the speed limit is 65, they, they may let you get away with 70. Sometimes you can get up to 75. But when you're hitting 80 and you see that red light and your heart starts panicking and you're just, just about to pull over and the thing just passes you by and go to somebody else and you be saying, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I thought they got me. Have you ever stood in a place and thought a person knew something about you that they didn't know? I remember one day, this is what fear does to you. I was a track coach. At, at uh, in Riverside at John North High School. And so one of the boys came up. I said, I know what you did. I know what you did. He said, did you see it? I said, yeah, I know what you did. He said, How did, I looked around. I didn't know anybody. I said, I know what you did. He said, well, I only had an ounce on me. I know what you did. And he started just, he's going, Oh, they brought in the SWAT team and hell, I know what you, I knew nothing about that boy. But that fear was, he's done something. Sometimes it's better to just shut your mouth. And even if they say, I know what you did, what did I do? You know what you did? No, you tell me what I did. A lot of folks don't know. So that's number two. Number three, it negatively affects the way you treat others. When you're worried, your eyes are all on you. Let me talk to you about selfishness. One of the things I dislike in life, I have a, 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 a brother and sister that got them a new Toyota. And when I walked down, and I said, man, that's a beautiful Toyota. God bless you. Here's what you don't want to hear. Well, I was going to get a Toyota. I just don't like Toyotas. You got red. I'm, what? What? This ain't your Toyota, boy. This is our Toyota. We like blue or red or whatever it is. But you, you, when people, these kind of people that are worried and fretful and fearful, they, they're not happy for anybody. The eyes are all on them. When you can go and see somebody, what a beautiful car you have. God bless you. When you're thankful for others, it's not about you. It's about them. Does that make sense? Go on down. It says, it, uh, worry reduces your ability to trust in God. How many ill effects of worry 
Are you experiencing? See, when you start worrying, God is out of the picture. He's out of the equation. What you're doing is looking at what you have. Let me share this with you. Every time God calls me to a ministry, he always calls me with nothing. Now, there are people that get started off and they got a whole lot of stuff. I've been in South America the last eight years. When God called me to South America, we started giving scholarships. We're funding churches. We're funding orphanages. The day that I committed myself, I didn't have the money. Does that make sense? But I said, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. Now, God doesn't always come up and give you a thousand dollars. But see, he'll touch Brother Eric's heart. He'll give me a hundred. Sister Constance give me a hundred. Sister Brenda give me a hundred. My daughter give me a hundred. Paris give me fifty cent. And 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 all of a sudden, then I get up there to Peru. Oh, I'm big timing now because I got a thousand dollars in my pocket. I said, brothers and sisters, the Lord indeed has blessed. And they're looking at me like I'm a multimillionaire. No, I trusted God for what he can do. Does that make sense? Have you ever woke up and felt something going on in your body? Well, you always think the worst. If you're breathing and a, and a pain hits here, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, God, uh, 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 I need open heart surgery. And all, it's just gas. That's all it is. It's gas. But... When you get your eyes off God, you're trusting in the situation. And I'm trying to tell you, there is no help that you can get when you have your eyes off God and your eyes on the situation. Does that make sense? you got to take one day at a time, trusting God each day to help you every day. There's days that you might come to the end of the day, you said, I didn't have much to eat. But I prayed out to God. I don't care if someone knocked on your door and gave you a McDonald's certificate for two cheeseburgers. Do you know that's God providing? If God will uh, close the grass of the field, what more will he do for his children? I'm closing this today, today the teaching. Why worry? Why keep worrying? Worrying makes your hair gray. Worrying raises your blood pressure. Worrying causes anxiety. Worry affects your memory. Worry causes you to go into inaction. What is good about worry? The Bible says trust in the Lord. That is the key to worry. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. I'm coming to the close. One of my uh, brethren came today, and I'm just going back to, I knew him when he was much younger. Um, he and his brother uh, uh, stayed in a, a mutual place, and we never knew that God would bless them with a nice apartment. And my, my brother Michael told me, said they got a beautiful apartment. Look at God. The trust has to always be in God. Does that make sense? Trust in the Lord. As I come to the end, I want to pray for you. I will start with those of you that are not saved. Those of you that are, uh, uh, don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's not hard to be saved. It's just to acknowledge that there is a God. Some people have too much pride to accept that there's a God. You didn't get here by yourself. The mountains didn't get here by themselves. The world twirling around uh, 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 365 uh, days in a year twirling around the sun. It didn't happen that way. It's happenstance. There's a God that's a creator. And you're just coming to God and you're saying, God, forgive me for my sins. Repeat after me if you're a sinner. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me and cleanse me. Lord, I get off the throne of my life. I don't want to be in charge. And I will you come in and sit on the throne or sit on the seat of my life sit on the seat of my heart. I put my trust in you and I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. If you have done this, the Bible said you are saved. Welcome to the family of God. Now, if you're a Christian and you're living in worry, you're living beneath your privilege. One thing you have to do 
is spend some time with the Lord. The Bible said, cast all your cares upon who? Him. For he careth for you. So, once we have done that, you are saved. I saw a picture this morning, Paula. I'm talking to your brother Pablo there in, in, in uh, Argentina. I saw his picture eating with your family today. Look like he's home. I don't know if he's completely uh, out of the facilities, but he was at home eating today. Unity thanks God for the progression that he has and the healing that's happening to his life. And tell Pablo, I see him in the future, and his future looks much brighter. May God bless you. This is Bishop Gabriel McCurtis saying, see you later. Bye-bye.